Tonight, a fiery explosion on the American side of a major bridge connecting the U.S. and Canada. He says, my God, it's a car. It's a vehicle and it's flying through the air. The speeding vehicle and deadly crash that caused border crossings to be shut down. The agonizing wait for families of the Hamas hostages. I just want to hug my children, to kiss them, to protect them. The release of some hostages now delayed. Relatives of a Muslim family run down in London, Ontario, speak out after a difficult emotional trial. The killer tried to divide us. What I saw instead was humanity came out. How they and the only survivor, just 11 years old, are coping. An exclusive television interview in The Breakdown. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Chaos and confusion at the Niagara Falls border today after a deadly explosion sparked fear and sent authorities in both Canada and the U.S. scrambling. New York's governor now says there was no indication of terrorism. A video of the incident has been released. It shows a car speeding towards the border before going airborne. That car then crashed and burst into flames. Police say the driver and a passenger were both killed. So that explosion happened on the U.S. portion of the Rainbow Bridge, a crossing that connects the Canadian and the U.S. side of Niagara Falls, both popular tourist destinations. Thomas Dagle is at that Niagara border crossing for us tonight. So, Thomas, I suppose there's no sign of it reopening. No, heavy trucks have been parked here at the entrance to the Rainbow Bridge on the Ontario side to keep traffic away. Uh, the staff of the Bridge Commission have been telling us they expect the bridge to be closed at least another couple days as investigators try to piece together what led to that fiery scene today. On a busy travel day at the U.S. border, a car is seen in the distance speeding near a checkpoint, hitting an obstacle, then flying. The impact igniting a fireball so big, emergency responders feared it was a deliberate attack. Could it possibly be a car bomb? I see debris scattered all over the place. In that charred vehicle, investigators found two bodies, including that of a local New Yorker. A U.S. border officer suffered minor injuries. The FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force sprung into action. While in Canada, the Prime Minister was briefed, leading to an abrupt departure from question period. I will have to excuse myself now uh, to go get further uh, further uh, updates. Then New York's governor answered the question so many were asking. There is no sign of terrorist activity with respect to this crash. Local authorities later said it all proved to be a tragic accident. The chaos leaving witnesses rattled. I've never seen anything like this. It was just incredible. The, the fire was so high up in the air. I was right there in the border security building when the explosion happened and the whole building shook. The incident forced travelers to scramble the day before U.S. Thanksgiving as the Rainbow Bridge and three other border crossings abruptly shuttered. Khalil Ghazi drove to Ontario intending to buy just a car park, then go back to New York. The border is closed. I don't know what to do. Literally, I'm calling everyone. So Aaron Beatty's wife recorded smoke. this video showing heavy smoke just as the border closed. All my stuff's over with her on the other side. I don't know what I'll do. Within hours, the three other nearby crossings reopened. At the Rainbow Bridge, investigators will continue combing through all that evidence, wondering what led to this sudden high-speed dash and the fiery scene that followed. So, Thomas, this investigation is clearly going to be really complicated. Yeah, the main piece of evidence, the car involved in that, ex that explosion um, is clearly destroyed. Uh, the governor of New York used the word incinerated to describe the state of that uh, vehicle. She said that investigators couldn't even make out where the license plate was from. The FBI, though, is said to have identified the driver. That is going to be a key piece of uh, evidence in this puzzle. Adrian. All right, Thomas Daglin, Niagara Falls, Ontario. In the Middle East tonight, the deal between Israel and Hamas was delayed just hours before dozens of hostages held in Gaza were to start being released. The timing of a ceasefire after seven weeks of fighting is now in question. And as Paul Hunter explains, what has been made clear is that after the truce, the war continues. The morning after, a deal to pause the assault was seemingly struck, bloodshed and despair yet again in Gaza. 
with more Israeli airstrikes. My message to Hamas said this man do not commit to a truce. The Israelis, he said, just want to kill. And then, indeed, hours later, an unsettling signal. The planned timing for a swap of Israeli hostages for Palestinians held in Israeli prisons was pushed back for at least a day, now to begin Friday at the earliest. I'm very nervous. It leaves families of the nearly 240 Israelis held in Gaza agonizing even more. I just want to hug my children, to kiss them, to protect them, to promise them that it will never happen again. As it stands, the plan is for a four-day break in the Israeli assault to allow 50 Israeli hostages to be freed in exchange for 150 Palestinian detainees. If it all does go ahead, the hope is that the break could then be extended. The more who are freed, the longer the truce. I think everybody understands exactly what they need to do. Uh, there's a very detailed text of what has to happen once this goes into place. The incentive uh, is for the continuous release of hostages, but that doesn't come uh, for nothing. Uh, if Hamas wants the pause to continue, we need to see more hostages coming out. The deal also includes desperately needed additional aid for displaced Gazans who've lost effectively everything. And it allows for Red Cross officials to visit the remaining hostages. But the looming truce also raises the question, can the war itself be drawn down? Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu still underlining Israel remains committed to destroying Hamas. Hamas, meanwhile, remains unwavering in its commitment to eliminate Israel. As it stands, 1,200 Israelis killed by Hamas October 7th, some 240 abducted. An estimated 14,000 Gazans killed in Israel's retaliation, with nearly 2 million more displaced. As the truce now ticks closer, maybe. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now, Israel has negotiated with Hamas for the release of hostages before, but never so many at once. And Yoana Rumiliota shows us that puts the country into territory that's at the same time familiar and uncharted. She's making a famous chicken soup. 84-year-old Ditsa Hyman is believed to be one of Hamas's hostages. Now for her daughter Netta, the agonizing question, for how much longer? It's a psycho psychologist terror, and I feel that if she won't release now, maybe she won't survive. Maybe did, she didn't survive until now. We don't know. We really don't know. On Israeli news, the names of children in captivity read out. Women and children are expected to be freed first. Under stage one of the plan, we expect to see the release of at least 50 live Israeli hostages. But the fact Israel underscores hostages must be returned alive speaks to how deep the distrust is. Hamas has not provided any information about their condition, and their families in Israel are sick with worry. For the families and the country, the issue of Israelis in captivity is a deeply emotional one. Israel has been willing to pay a high price to bring hostages home in the past. Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit was released by Hamas in 2011 in exchange for more than 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. I fear that they will keep the hostages close to them because they would not want to give up for this uh, insurance policy. This former commander at Israel's security agency has been consulted on the current hostage deal. He expects Hamas will manipulate Israel's historical commitment to bring every hostage home. How long do you think they might prolong the process to get as much as they can? They will prolong it until the last minute that we will fight in Gaza. So maybe they will release in stages until they, they, they will have only 20 to 50 last hostages. But they will keep them until the last shot or until the last drop of blood. And he says the war will rage on between ceasefires. Hostages could be held indefinitely or caught in the crossfire. We hope that she will come back. We, we hope that they all come back. Hope, it's hanging in the balance. And while the prospect of the first hostage deal does offer some, 
for families especially, it comes with a new kind of torture too. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. It took just over two days for a jury to find a former RCMP intelligence official guilty of breaking Canada's secrets law. It was a history-making trial, and as Catherine Tunney explains, the defence team is vowing to continue the fight. Cameron Ortis once had access to Canada's most sensitive secrets. Now he's in jail for leaking them. <laughs> a win, says the Crown, for Canada's national security. We are pleased with the outcome. We think what it does is it signals the importance with which Canada takes the protection of sensitive information and that those who don't respect sensitive information will be prosecuted. A jury found the former RCMP intelligence official guilty on all six charges against him, including three counts of sharing special operational information without authority. They agreed he leaks intelligence to men with ties to the criminal underworld, including suspected agents of a notorious money laundering syndicate. I think an innocent man has just been found guilty of six serious offenses. Ortis never contested that he shared sensitive information, but told the jury it was part of a plot to protect Canadians, testifying that he received a call from a secret foreign agency that he says he couldn't reveal, warning him of a grave threat. The verdict left his defense team angry and ready to appeal. I've had my faith in the jury system shaken before. I, I, I really, I, I'm really at a loss for words. This was the first time Security of Information Act charges were tested in court, a case watched by Canada's security community and its intelligent allies, whose information was part of the leaks. What our allies really wanted to see was to make sure that when push came to shove that we were able to clean house and make sure that the people who are involved in these kinds of activities actually face consequences for those actions. Ortis's lawyer says he served enough time behind bars waiting for this trial. The Crown disagrees and says it will seek a severe sentence, 20 years or more. A judge will decide early next year. Catherine Tunney, CBC News, Ottawa. India has resumed electronic visa services for all Canadians, including tourists. The ban was introduced in September, just after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau accused the country of having a potential role in the killing of a B.C. Sikh activist. The Indian government denied any involvement, calling the allegations absurd. Diplomatic tensions may not be over. The United States has now issued a warning to India after it reportedly thwarted a plan to kill a Sikh separatist on American soil. As Ashley Burke explains, the plot was similar to Canada's allegations, but India's reaction is very different. This is Gurpakwan Singh Panu, and I'm here right here in London. This is the Sikh separatist allegedly targeted in an assassination plot. The Financial Times reporting the U.S. thwarted an attempt to kill Gurpatwan Singh Panu and accuses India's government of playing a role. The White House says we are treating this issue with utmost seriousness and it has been raised by the U.S. government with the Indian government, including at the most senior levels. We have been working closely with uh, our allies, including the Americans, uh, since, uh, since the middle of the summer. In June, Canadian Sikh activist Hardeep Singh Nijjar was shot and killed in British Columbia. He knew Panu. In September, Trudeau made a serious claim in the House, saying Canadian security agencies were pursuing credible allegations. Of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijjar. India has called Canada's allegations absurd. These allegations were raised by Prime Minister Trudeau with Prime Minister and Prime Minister rejected them but in stark contrast, isn't rejecting the U.S. claims. India's government says it takes the allegations seriously and it's already being examined by relevant departments. I think it would be harder now for New Delhi to dismiss the allegations that Canada has made uh, in light of the allegations that the U.S. has shared with India. During a virtual G20 leader summit Wednesday with India's Prime Minister, Trudeau said he addressed it. I re-emphasize how important it is to abide by the rule of law and to engage constructively uh, with each other when we have uh, issues of concern. 
In a statement, Panu said this foiled attempt on his life is a threat to American sovereignty, and he'll let the U.S. government respond to it. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The family of an Alberta man is grieving tonight. It's believed he died on the battlefield in Ukraine. Julia Wong sat down with Josh Meyer's family, who explained why he felt compelled to join the war. I talked him into wearing a, a red suit. Through her grief, Catherine Unverite is focusing on her good memories of husband Josh Myers. He was always someone with a, with a really big heart. That's what she says compelled the 34-year-old paramedic to volunteer to fight in Ukraine. He just really um, felt strongly about doing what was right and helping people and supporting them. I wasn't happy he was going, but once it was clear that was his choice, um, very much supportive. Myers arrived in Ukraine in early September. He served as both a paramedic and on the front lines. Because it is an assault brigade, it's much more of an offensive. So I know he was very, very scared to join that unit. Unverite believes her husband died near Bakhmut November 10th. A member of his team told her Myers was killed in a drone strike. It was, of course, shocking at first. Um, very hard to believe. Worst moment of my life. I was in denial. The news, difficult for Meyer's parents to digest. It was something I'll never forget. And I just, I wanted proof. I didn't want to believe it. Global Affairs Canada says it is aware of an incident involving a Canadian in Ukraine, but it hasn't confirmed his death. His family says it's been too dangerous to retrieve Meyer's body as fighting continues near Bakhmut. As for Unverite, she hopes Meyer's memory and his convictions will live on. He felt that it was so important for him to, to do the right thing and, and fight, for, fight for a cause, that, the biggest cause of all that he could think of and, and help people to his final day. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Some major retailers are saying goodbye to a growing trend. I'm happy to see that their self-checkouts are gone. Why some stores are putting humans back behind the cash register. Another Canadian astronaut is heading to space. I have dreamt about exploring my whole life, dreamt about going to space my whole life. And... What the hell? An Ontario Christmas tree gets its late-night moment. You know it's bad when it makes it on Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> We're back at two. There is another twist in the story of who is leading tech giant OpenAI, the creators of ChatGPT. The company now says co-founder Sam Altman will return as CEO, and the board of directors that ousted him on Friday is being replaced. Hundreds of employees had threatened to quit, if Altman wasn't brought back. Some big box stores, including some in this country, are doing away with self-checkout machines. Companies claim it just comes down to customer experience. But as Sophia Harris shows us, there may be another reason behind it. This Canadian tire in North Bay, Ontario, is bucking a big box store trend. In July, it opened more cashier lanes and ditched its self-checkouts. It just felt like it was time to get rid of them. The store's general manager says the machines just weren't a good fit. Canadian tires carry so many big products, whether it's snow blowers, gazebos, generators, don't really lend themselves to self-checkouts. Many customers seem to agree. I'm happy to see that their self-checkouts are gone. I prefer this just because I like the contact with person to person. Several other stores have also recently removed their self-checkouts, including this Toronto area Canadian tire, and three Walmarts in Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> Never mind. And Booth supermarket chain in England is phasing out the machines in nearly all of its stores. They've complained before when we did have the self-service checkouts that they didn't like them. So I think they like the one-to-one -one bit of it and being able to talk to a person. This shopper has another reason. The main thing is the jobs for young people in the future. Computers are taking away too many jobs. Self-checkout started gaining prominence about a decade ago. 
a way for retailers to cut labor costs and speed up the checkout process. But some problems have persisted. A lot of people resented the move to self-checkout, feeling like they're told to do their own work. There are also technical hurdles, like figuring out how to scan produce with no barcodes. And then there's the downside risk. The theft is a big, big issue. and It's just that you, there's so many ways you can game the system. A new survey polled 2,000 American shoppers. 15% admitted to stealing at self-checkout. 21% said they've accidentally taken an item without scanning it. That's an awful lot of people who are walking away from self-checkout without paying for stuff that they should be paying for. But experts say there's a good reason why self-checkout isn't going away. It's popular with many shoppers. I, I love it. It's very effective and it just lets me just do my thing. It's just really convenient for people such as myself and others that are just quickly on the go and know exactly what they need. So the self-checkout debate continues with both customers and stores taking sides. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. People in Gaza are desperately awaiting a ceasefire as they struggle with few supplies. The fridge is just a glorified food cupboard because we've had no electric power. We hear from a man who had the chance to leave but chose to stay. And the family of the London attack victim speak out after an emotional trial. I wanted to go to them and tell them we got justice for you and I couldn't. But first, a new mission for Canada's astronauts. I think this is right for Canada and I am thrilled to do it. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. There they are, the Grey Cup champs are back in Montreal and they are having a party. First, the Alouettes showed off their brand new hardware during a packed parade. And then they took to the stage to thank their fans for their support during their unlikely run to the championship. The Grey Cup is where it belongs. This franchise deserves it. You fans deserve it. Merci beaucoup. I love you very much. Love that. The Alouettes won the Grey Cup after a late touchdown against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers on Sunday night. Overall, this is the team's eighth championship. Well, two Canadian astronauts are celebrating big wins of their own tonight. Their new assignments have been revealed. As Nicole Mortolaro explains, one is heading to the International Space Station. The other is part of a moon mission. Josh Kutrick will be the fourth Canadian astronaut to embark on the extended mission to the ISIS space station. For Joshua Kutrick, it's a dream come true, a mission to space. I have wow. dreamt about exploring my whole life, dreamt about going to space my whole life. And so to be that much closer and have the chance to do that now is wonderfully fulfilling. I see. In an announcement at the Canadian Space Agency, the 41-year-old was named as the next Canadian astronaut to head to the International Space Station. And lift off. He's scheduled to travel aboard Boeing's new ship, called Starliner, which is still undergoing test flights. If those go well, Kutrick would be on its first mission to the ISS in 2025. I feel super excited. I'm confident in it. Uh, I am doing exactly what I want to do, and I'm very grateful for, for that. And in that, he's not alone. 35-year-old fellow Canadian astronaut Jenny Givens was also announced as a member of the Artemis II mission. I think this is right for Canada, and I am thrilled to do it. She will train for a position at Mission Control and be the backup for Jeremy Hansen. He is set to become the first Canadian to orbit the moon next November. I think this is a signal of um, the trust that is placed in Canada and the emphasis on the value of our contributions to the international um, collaboration that is space. The scientist heading Canada's project to land a rover on the moon says these announcements are impressive. We have a small core of only four astronauts and so not too many flights and to have an announcement with you know two opportunities, two missions for two different astronauts is super exciting. It's all an expression of faith in Canada's space program and a reason for many to celebrate. Nicole Mortolero, CBC News, Toronto.
Now we go deeper into the story shaping our world. Relatives of the Muslim family run down and killed in London, Ontario, explain why they believe the crimes must be labeled terrorism. But first, a video diary from Gaza on the trials and traumas of war. This is the breakdown. Scenes from Gaza you won't see anywhere else. Now, as you can see, they're relying on the donkey carts. A British national chose to stay to help however he could. I'm OK, it's been quite a day, to be honest. For weeks now, he's been showing us these exclusive snapshots of life on the edge. Hadi has been practicing jumping from a chair and landing on his feet. Hello, Hadi. We first made contact with Mohammed Galini on October the 12th, just hours after the evacuation orders from Israel's defense forces. Since then, he's been sending us videos that break down the reality of surviving in Gaza. We've received news that um, everyone in Gaza is to depart by 5 p.m. I am worried for what's to come. Our car it can only take five, so we might have to. The elderly and more infirm will go in, go by car, and I will probably go in a group with the people that are able to walk. We've seen like awful scenes of people just coming from Gaza on foot. The view of a man who made a most extraordinary decision. British national Mohammed Galini, an air quality scientist from Manchester. He was in Gaza on vacation when the war started, was permitted to leave through Rafa weeks ago, but he didn't go. You had a chance to leave and you took your family to Rafa, but you didn't go. And I think that's a decision that a lot of people would say, what, what on earth, why didn't you leave? Yeah, I mean, people in Gaza are asking me the same thing, actually. Mm. Hard to imagine making that call. He knows the danger, was really worried for his family, his dad in particular. And my dad, he gets quite anxious. We'd sleep in the same room, I'd sleep next to him, and um, when a bomb went off, I found myself kind of reaching for his hand. And, and but you know what? I didn't know if it was for me or for him, because I think it was probably a bit of both. We had news today that my dad and my brothers will uh, be travelling. Their names are on the list. My name is there also, but I've decided I'm staying. Uh, we're on our way to the border now. Uh, my dad, brothers, uh, and my name has come up. They're, um, they're just saying goodbye to, to people. We've been here for about seven hours, maybe, uh, and yes, we've just been told categorically that there won't be any uh, travel today. People are quite, people are quite upset, understandably. I've just said goodbye to my father and stepmother and family. I feel I'm in a position to make a difference. How? I have like skills that can help in a crisis like this. I, I'm a Qualified first aider. I'm very practical, so I know how to, you know, get things working. Just kind of keep things ticking. Are you okay? By the way, are you? I'm okay. It's been like uh, it's been quite a day, to be honest. This is the Khanunis High Street. I don't even know what happened here. Like you can't even keep track. We connected with Galini several times over the last few weeks. Hi, this is Mohamed Galayini. As he it's moved from Gaza City to Han Yunus and got ready to move again. Part of the vast human wave constantly squeezed further south as ordered by Israel's defense forces. Hi, it's Mohamed. It's the 8th of November. It's the 13th of November. I think it's the 36th day of the war now. He'd send in videos, answer questions by WhatsApp. It's just very stressful. And found a moment for a brief interview. What happens? Like, I'm just curious as you and I are talking, where are you getting your power from? How are you watching the TV? I'm at a, a, a youth uh, empowerment organization through donations. They have a lovely bank of power, solar power uh, and batteries. I'm actually sitting on a battery right now. So I'm, I'm at the source of power. Yeah. yeah, so this was bombed a few weeks ago now. Yeah, we've lost track, everything's destroyed. Usually, um, 
garbage disposal will be by cars, but now, as you can see, they're relying on the donkey carts. The median age in Gaza is 18, so many little ones in harm's way. Beyond trying to keep them safe and feeling safe, there's the constant need to try to lift their spirits. Okay, so Hadi has been practicing jumping from a chair and landing on his feet. Yellow Hadi. Galini says if all he could do was keep the kids entertained, he'd feel useful. Uh, these guys have actually not been out of the house for a while, so I'm taking them for a little walk to the, um, to the shop. To be out is getting riskier even in Han Yunus, the IDF's operations seemingly expanding. It's getting harder to figure out where to go and harder to feel safe. Avoid crowds. People are afraid with being in proximity to anyone that they don't know, lest that person be on a target. That's terrorizing, basically, because you don't know where it's going to come from, and everyone's afraid of everyone else now as much as they are of the Israelis. Crowds, though, unavoidable sometimes. Five pharmacies, he says he had to try to get the most basic of medicine. This pharmacy had a different dosage, and uh, so this is like one half of a month's supply. And it's worse if you want water. So this is the daily struggle to get water, filling these containers to then fill up the water container. The guy goes around like calling fresh water, fresh water. I'm now in my grandfather's apartment. He died 30 years ago. I'm here with four, 13 of my cousins, two families, nine children. We're lucky to have an actual kitchen. That's our drinking water on the right. The fridge is just a glorified food cupboard because we've had no electric power since a month now. That's our empty gas canister. There is one outside that's full, but we don't know what we'll do when that runs out. What is okay today may not be tomorrow. He says he knows his family is lucky to have access to resources, but for how long? And for how long can you keep fear at bay? I was asked if I was afraid. I'm not really afraid. I know that like death or serious injury is a possibility, but like I'm not really afraid. I'm more dejected, tired, angry. Yeah, there were events that day that I can't stand by, but can the world stand by what Israel is doing to us? The political is personal, and in a one-day-at-a-time existence, living in Gaza right now takes every ounce of energy. Hope, the sort of luxury only a few can afford. So Mohammed left us a voice message today. He says seven more relatives from his extended family are now sheltering with him. That includes several children with another expected soon. So that's 25 people in one house. We are, of course, staying in touch with him as best as possible. There have been days with no internet, no communication at all. But as we get updates, we will pull them together for you. Next, the family of the London attack victims await a crucial sentence. For me, the, the terrorism label will bring some measure of security. They talk with us about how they're coping after a horrific tragedy. Next. In a television exclusive, relatives of the Avzal family talk about the trial of the man who ran down and killed four of their loved ones. I miss them so much because I wanted to go to them and tell them we got justice for you. They're convinced many Canadians will be safer if the judge calls his crimes an act of terror. Whoever is out there with murderous intent, they may think uh, twice. Ali and Hina Islam watched the trial in Windsor in person and by Zoom, reliving the grief and anger they have carried for more than two years. This is about the justice they still crave and their love for the ones they lost. I lost an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a friend. They were my only other family in London. and I always Leave it to the kids to say it with such clarity. This is a memorial video and it is brutally beautiful. I miss our family dinners. And this is Aisha Islam, there with Yumna Avzal, her cousin. They were so little, there was so much more. 
Aisha's parents, Ali and Hena Islam, looking on. The way they made my brothers and I feel... And really, they haven't been able to look away or think of anything else since that terrible day, June 6, 2021. A man in a pickup truck driving into their family, murdering Yumna, her mom, Madiha, her dad, Salman, her grandmother, Talat. Just Yumna's little brother survived. The murderer tried and convicted, sentencing still to come. Healing? That seems so far off. I think most Canadians who think about them have, you know, the single image in their head of that, that one photograph. Help us understand uh, who, who they were, who they still are to you. Uh, it's almost as if you were going to uh, choose uh, someone for a TV role um, and you wanted a decent family. This would be it. They're almost like plucked out of a fictional Mayberry. Um, you could not beat them for niceness. It's, it's just impossible. Um, Salman, in his job, touched many senior citizens as a role, uh, as, a, as a physiotherapist in that role. Um, worked at several nursing homes, taking care of our most frail citizens. Madiha, uh, uh, an engineer, uh, trying to get her PhD, uh, doing uh, environmental uh, research, often the, f the only uh, woman in her class, Yumna. Uh, what a talent, what an artist, uh, and Auntie Talat, just uh, a wonderful matriarch for that, uh, for that household. They, they kept others in their hearts, and it was the most beautiful thing about them. It wasn't just one person, but every single person mm -hmm. in that family. And when I heard the verdict, my initial response, like, I missed them. I missed them so much because I wanted to go to them and tell them what, what just happened, that we got justice for you, and I couldn't. The one survivor, the Afzal's son, is only 11 now. His aunt and uncle helping to care for him, and they protect his privacy with all they have. There's, there's a little boy uh, who survived, mm -hmm. and... Um, I think people have been thinking about him. Certainly the uh, prayers uh, and the expression of support from people across the country has been instrumental for our family to get through this time. I'll say that he's um, happy and healthy and doing what an 11-year-old should. Community support has been sustaining throughout, and yes, there is relief at the first-degree murder convictions. But that trial, they say, was utterly traumatizing. And what is still unclear is whether the judge will rule the murders were motivated by hate, that this was terrorism. Where we're at with this trial is, is interesting and important because the judge has a decision to make, right, about whether it was terrorism that drove the first-degree murder charges. How important is that decision to you? Uh, for me, the, the terrorism label will bring some measure of security to many uh, minority communities. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the first time that uh, someone who uh, was born and raised in Canada has white skin, not part of an organization, uh, will be labeled a terrorist. And I've and I have full confidence that the judge uh, will, will do just that. When I was growing up, the movies I watched, the TV I watched, I was uh, sort of taught to believe that a terrorist was a brown man uh, wearing uh, some turban, uh, yelling in a strange language with uh, a machine gun. And that's not the case anymore. So the, the next time that there's a Muslim family or an LGBT parade or a Carabana uh, a celebration, Whoever is out there with murderous intent, they may think um, twice. So this is home, and it will be home, but do you feel differently about your home? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say, uh, no, I don't feel differently about home, because uh, it's in my vested interest to make sure that uh, my country, our country, um, is the best it can be. The terrorists wanted to, to drive us apart based on uh, the skin color, a few millimeters of our uh, epidermis, but that's not what Canadians are. Um, uh, we're a country of decency, um, of politeness, uh, of respect, 
uh, we're a country where uh, you dig your neighbor out if they're you know in a snow drift or you drop food off at their home if they had an operation. It's our home and we want to make it the best home possible. Um, I'd like to add to that I do work with a lot of youth and I worry for them. After this attack, my own children, they came to us struggling to process what their identity is as a Canadian. And my son said to me um, that if, we, if a time ever comes that we have to leave Canada because we're not welcome here, he was 14 years old then, where do we go? Because he was born here. This is home. And when I heard that from my son, and I heard those sim similar sentiments from other youth, that worried me. And so to empower the youth, to, to let them know, no, no, your voice will be heard, became essential. I work with In the, the name of her lost family, family, in honor of them, Hina says as a psychotherapist, she wants to spend time and resources fighting Islamophobia. And so it's not as simple as you hear the guilty verdict and, okay, that's, that's good, we can move forward. For, for family, there's still a massive hole that will continue to exist. And now that this, the trial is done, I can put my energy towards working towards um, fighting hate. The killer tried to divide us, tried to isolate Muslims. That was his intention. And what I saw instead was humanity came out. There was a convergence of humanity. People from different faiths, different colors, different walks of life, they were there at that intersection. Every time I would walk there, there, there would be people hugging us, supporting us. That's where humanity came out. And I, I wish, my hope is that we can take that humanity, take the, the momentum and continue it forward. So it will be up to the Superior Court Justice to make that call on whether the attack amounted to terrorism. She will base that on all the evidence presented in court during the upcoming sentencing process. The family is asking for that hearing to be moved from Windsor to London where the attack happened. You can imagine the victim impact statements will be powerful. Next, a Canadian Christmas tree that has Americans talking. You know it's bad when it makes it on Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> the sad to say it, but underwhelming tree makes international Did news just, like, the tree, in our moment. Like the Late night host Jimmy Fallon took notice of some Canadian Christmas celebrations this week, gently poking fun at an Ontario town's tree lighting ceremony. So the tree itself is, well, frankly, it's in rough shape. So organizers decided to take a unique approach for the lights this year. The crowd's stunned reaction is our moment. People made some aesthetic choices about what to do with the tree. and. It came up unique. What the hell? The tree lighting, it's been a ritual. And the last month, Aurelia has been broadcasting. It was going to be a big display, and it was going to be better than all the other years. Damn! As soon as I saw it light up, I'm like, oh, seriously? That's what we're got here? <laughs> <laughs> the tree's not in really good health. It's dying. And so it was made to, like, let's try this. Um, so, yeah, so we did. We did try this. <laughs> And we tried this new, new, unique-looking Christmas tree. Looked like a palm tree. <laughs> you kind of just have to take it with a bit of a light heart. That's it. What the hell? The 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 tree got lit. You know it's bad when it makes it on Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> this is going viral. A town in Canada just held their big Christmas tree lighting. You know you messed up when you get a Canadian mad enough to say hell. Oh boy. <laughs> Pretty sure that's not what we want to be known for, but hey, it could be worse, I guess. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. So apparently somebody in the crowd started a second countdown thinking, well, it's got to be better than this. It was not. Now they're saying, well, maybe they need to lean into it, you know, make mugs and T-shirts with that unique tree on them. From all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app. Subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrienne Arsenault.
Take care.